Well, good morning, good evening, good late night, early morning, depending on where you are in the world. Today, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> autophagy. Uh, we're going to, this one has some technical terms in it, but don't get too uh, put off by it. I'm here. I'll help, uh, I'll help talk about and define some of those terms. And Jesus and I need to talk about how we can uh, move it to a little bit uh, easier to understand. But again, I'll see, see what I can translate today. Um, <clears throat> we're not just talking about autophagy though. We're talking about autophagy and its impact on arterial plaque. In other words, is it possible to reverse plaque with autophagy? Everybody, uh, everybody wants to reverse their plaque. Uh, it's actually happened. We've actually recorded it. I'm one of maybe three people that I have seen that happen with. So don't get too excited about, I'm going to reverse and pull all of my plaque out of my arteries. Um, that's usually not a practical goal. But what is a practical goal is complete stabilization and loss of risk getting that risk off the table. So <clears throat> before I start going too far off script, let's, let me get back to the script for today. So if, you've, if you're new to the channel, we're all about heart attack, stroke prevention, cardiovascular disease. We also talk about some other things too, like we're going to be doing a series uh, uh, soon on uh, colorectal cancer, especially colorectal cancer in people less than 50 years old. It's a big deal. We're also going to be doing as uh, we we did that series in the past. We also did that in the past, um, and uh, plan to bring out some of that uh, old information because people don't remember it; they haven't seen it in a while. But we're going to add a lot of new information too. We're also going to be doing a men's health. Uh, series, things like um, prostate cancer, uh, screening for it, what to do about it, what it really looks like. You know, with men's prostate cancer, there's a, there's a concept of, you know, if you do, uh, if you do biopsies on 60 year old men, 60% of them will have cancer in there. 70 year old men, 70% will have cancer. 80 year old men, 80% will have cancer. But these cancers are not killing men. There's just a subclass of very aggressive cancers. And we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about the fact that men tend to deny their disease much more so than women. So men's health is a big deal. And if you look at our YouTube channel, over half of our viewers are men. And, um, so our group may not be as quick to deny health, but, you know, I know that I do it too. Uh, if it's not something that I uh, take care of myself, I really put off going to the doctor. Now, I know that's a terrible thing for me to say, but I'm just a man too. And that's what happens with men. We'll also be talking about, yes, every time the subject of men's health comes up, we'll be talking uh, ED. Erectile uh, dysfunction comes up. We'll be talking about some of that. Um, and we'll also be talking about some of the drug treatments. You know, one of the things that many men do not know is that one of the better treatments for um, prostatitis, benign prostatic hypertrophy, is uh, Cialis, one of the drugs that's also given for um, ED. Now, why does that work out? Again, uh, just stay tuned. We'll be talking about that at that point in time. But again, let's get back to some of the things that we've covered recently. Meat and heart disease. Should you go vegan? Uh, the answer is meat is not that much of a risk. Um, but again, to get the whole, to get the details, go back and take a look at the videos. Uh, the myth behind dairy fat. There's a lot of myths behind dairy fat and they just don't go away. Aspirin for secondary prevention. So <clears throat> again, a lot of content there related to, and that's just related to cardiovascular disease, the things that are killing and disabling us. And that's just over the past three weeks. 
So <clears throat> what, what's our core content? Our core content are things that are killing and disabling us. Used to be just in America and other wealthy countries, but now it's all over the world. China, India, these things have become the major problems, even uh, Japan, the major problems that are killing and disabling people. Um, insulin resistance, prediabetes, cardiovascular inflammation, plaque. And guess what? You go to places like the medical science, Harvard, Mayo Clinic, it's really clear that despite the fact that these things are what's killing us, two thirds of our primary care doctors, family practitioners, internists, even cardiologists do not know how to make a diagnosis, a simple diagnosis of prediabetes, let alone know how to manage it. So uh, there's a lot of, I, I hate to say it, but it's like that old adage, buyer beware. There's a lot of buyer beware if you're a patient uh, in our current health day systems. So there's some things that you need to know. Uh, on a practical basis, here's what we did. We looked to see, okay, how can we make it possible within just two hours for a, a, a person, a non-medical person, to learn about insulin resistance, prediabetes, cardiovascular inflammation, plaque, cardiovascular plaque, in just a couple of hours, and end up knowing more than 95% of doctors. That's what these courses are about. So if you have an interest, take a look. Um, we're doing some reviews of our, um, of our media approach. One of our consultants asked us, they said, you know, the locals in uh, Rumble are new. They're, uh, they're getting some bumps recently, but do you want to put that much effort into it? And the bottom line is we're able to get that content out without a whole lot of extra effort. So, uh, and I know there's a lot of folks that have already said, Hey, I'm a local school locals person and um, keep that up there. Thanks for, for doing that. If you have an interest in helping us get this content out, it's life-saving content. It's going all over the world. In fact, our number, our number five uh, country in the world for uploading um, our content is China. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Chinese government, uh, that's not my point, but there's a whole, there are billions of people there who deserve to have good health too. Maybe deserve to have a better government, but that's a different topic for a different channel. I'm not going to talk about subscriptions today and not, and I'm not going to talk about the book. Just going to do a quick reminder for those of you who are interested in patavastatin. We've covered this several times. Zip, zipitamag is a, it's what's called a, um, it's technically not a generic, but it's a generic, and I've tried it myself. Some people have had uh, good success with it. I have. I've had success with it, and um, you can access it right here in the U.S., Marley Drug, 1-800-286-6781. Now, I do not make any, uh, I don't have any, uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, a, I don't make any money by that referral. I'm just wanting to make, make my patients aware that that is available. Patavastatin is one of the statins that's currently hasn't broken its, um, its patent. So it's incredibly expensive. Um, and it's the only one that doesn't push you down that prediabetes highway. It does decrease cardiovascular uh, inflammation for those of you who have that knowledge and that interest. Now, uh, a lot of people are asking about the cardiovascular uh, programs and the overall Medicare Advantage programs. The Medicare Advantage programs are, are gearing up. They're doing very well. Um, every time I mention it on the channel, people start calling Michelle and say, hey, I want to I, I sign up. And yes, uh, you should do that. But just be aware, we're creating a waiting list. Um, there's too many people to sign up immediately. Um, and it's going to take uh, weeks, in fact, months for uh, some of the things that, uh, that we need to do. But go ahead and call and get on the waiting list. Um, the programs that we're starting, the CCM program, very well received. And guess what? Medicare is very excited about that program, too, because it keeps people out of the hospital. 
because it keeps them well, because it keeps people aware of what they're doing in terms of their lifestyle issues and in touch with us, with our office. So <clears throat> that's a little bit about the CCM program. For those of you who've said, you know, Doc, you started one of these in, Med in uh, Alabama. You used to teach it in Florida. Um, I would like my own doc to get involved with this. How can that happen? Well, we listened. We developed a YouTube channel for this. We developed a, um, a website. We've got a whole new business model where we can actually help your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your PA, learn how to do prevention and learn how to actually make it work financially for them. When we go through our training in medical school, we learn a lot of prevention techniques, but we get out and very few doctors use them because there was just no way to survive financially in a preventive environment. Well, guess what? Times have changed and we're there to, we can, we have a new business now where we can actually uh, show your docs how to do prevention and survive and in fact thrive financially. And it's uh, here, the, take a note of the, of the links, uh, the physicians network dot prevmedhealth.com, youtube.com at doctors prevention network. We may end up changing those, but um, that's what we have right now. Be aware of it. Now, to get into some of the content, a short, ver uh, short content for today, GLP-1s and OSA. What's it? OSA? Um, <clears throat> obstructive sleep apnea. It's a big deal. This was an article in the American Thoracic Society, 2015. I asked, uh, I saw this article and I asked Jesus to put it in our deck for today. And here's why. You may remember, I keep saying, when I did my trial of Ozempic, I slept harder than I had since I was a teenager. In fact, I slept walked. Now, you may say, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. I'm not saying you're going to do that. I am saying that there are people who end up sleeping much, much better when they go on a glip points. And, and what is that all about? You know, for those of you who are not connecting the dots, GLP-1, Ozempic, you know, that's the drug that you can't get today because there's a shortage because all of these uh, wealthy people are now using it for weight loss. It is a great drug for weight loss. And it's no surprise, given what I do for a living in terms of preventing heart attack and stroke, cardiovascular disease, that the best drug for weight loss that we've ever had also happens to be one of the best drugs we've ever had for diabetes. Um, what surprised me totally out of the blue was for me and for some of our patients, the impact on sleep. So here's the article. <clears throat> the authors investigated the effect of glip ones uh, for treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. The glip one is an incretin. Remember it's uh, glucagon-like protein. It's at the interface of metabolic and ventilatory networks. 27 subjects age 46 plus or minus nine years with high apnea hypopnea index. In other words, they would quit breathing often. They assign these in their sleep and that's, you know, that's rough on your body. It, it decreases your ability to sleep. It decreases your, um, your healing aspects of your sleep and people die a slow death when they can't get good sleep. So what's going on here? Well, let's just, let me get back to the, to the script. The uh, GLP-1 agonist treatment or the Ozempic uh, drug type treatment was given for four weeks. Two, two polysomnograms, well, polysomnogram, poly, um, it's a sleep study. Uh, poly means they take a lot of different um, charts and somnogram uh, means chart of sleep. So they, they obtained these at four week intervals. And so they did it before the GLP-1 or Ozempic, and then they did it after Ozempic. 70% of subjects showed an improvement with reduction of up to 44% of the events per hour. So big, big decrease in 
um, obstructive sleep apnea. I have that. And I actually saw a, uh, an obstructive sleep apnea specialist. Uh, one of the ones that's very well known, I'm not going to mention his name because I've got a critical comment about it. When I tried this, I, I discussed that with him and he said, Hmm, I don't know. Doesn't ring any bells. Gosh, if the sleep ap uh, apnea specialists, the guys out there aren't aware of this, it's like, Hmm. Anyway, there's no difference in BMI, uh, body fat. So this was before there was any change in uh, weight loss within group or versus controls. So that's another interesting point, because when this happens, you start thinking about what could the mechanism have been? Did they already lose weight enough in that four weeks to where it was just a weight loss issue? That's what the significance of that point is. No, it wasn't from weight loss. So the GLP-1 agonists might improve obstructive sleep apnea, regardless of weight. Interesting point. I told you so. I told you there's something going on in relation to sleep. So uh, to get to that, that finishes up our short topics, our intros for the day. And to get us to the main topic, arterial plaque reversal using autophagy. If you'll give us the water... So thanks for the water ball, Gilbert. Autophagy. Now let's stop and just talk a little bit about what that is. You know, most people who watch the internet, especially who watch the little scientifically lean, technically leaning shows in uh, biomedical stuff like ours, know what autophagy is. But in case you don't, you know, just like all these things, just break the word down. Auto means self, phage means to eat. And this is not talking about people eating themselves. This is talking about, well, maybe it is in a way. It's talking about the cell eating itself. It's just like recycling on a cellular level. So what happens if you don't have, if, if you're not giving your cells a whole bunch of external uh, sources of calories, the cell the cells in your body have to have something to burn. So they start taking parts of the, the, the cell to burn. And that's not a bad thing. In fact, what that's been found to be very, very helpful for health. There's actually some drugs uh, uh, on maybe gray market at this point. Uh, things like um, rapamycin where people say, you know what, can I take rapamycin? Uh, it's back and forth. Uh, it used to be black market for it, but even when it was, it was still um, something that was used on stents. It was used on um, some, along with some cancer drugs. And it actually stimulates autophagy as well. In fact, we'll talk about mTOR a little bit later in this show. Let me get back to the, to the script. Autophagy is a cellular catabolic, catabolic meaning um, the metabolism where you're using your cells, you're using store, your stores of energy to live on rather than external energy. It's a catabolic process responsible for the destruction of long-lived proteins and organelles. What are organelles? Well, organelles, you know, in the body you have organs like the heart, the lungs, uh, the stomach. In the cell, you have little subcomponents as well, like the nucleus, where you keep the, the DNA, uh, Golgi apparatus, where you uh, build the proteins that the cell needs to carry out its life, um, and mitochondria, which just about everybody that thinks about age has heard of. So you get these organelles, mitochondria especially, get sort of burned out, just like a, a mitochondria is the... Is the um, it's like the furnace of, um, of the cell. It creates energy. And these things get beat up a little bit as they continue to go through that highly oxidative process. 
one of the best things for our health, our body, it's, this has been discovered over the past 20 years, is for us to clean out those old beat up uh, mitochondria and other organelles and let the, them be replaced by healthier, newer ones. Now, back to the, uh, to the script here. And it says via doing this activity, that destruction of, of uh, aging organelles via lysosome dependent pathway. We, if you look on the side there, one of the things that you're, we're starting to show, and I did this uh, a couple of years ago, there was a great New England Journal article with some great graphics showing what a lysosome is. It's, a, it's an organelle within the cell and it contains uh, enzymes and those enzymes um, digest protein. So you want to get some uh, lysosomal activity. And again, as long as you're just uh, stuff in your face and gaining weight and, and not going on any kind of fasting mode, it's going to be hard to get that kind of activity. You know, if you've heard that once, you'll hear it multiple times during this discussion. Uh, it occurs on basal conditions. It mediates homeostatic functions. I'm not going to stop to explain what that means. It plays a critical role in vascular disease, such as atherosclerosis. Blocking mTOR has shown an additional benefit. So mTOR is the mammalian, it stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Remember, I mentioned rapamycin when we started this discussion, and rapamycin comes from the island of Rapa Nui, one of the Easter islands. I did a, I did a, a series of videos on this. Uh, you may remember a fellow named David Sabatini. Um, he won some science awards for discovering mTOR and the impact. So what happens is rapamycin is a chemical that was um, developed out of some, I think, mold or fungus that was found on that island. And uh, what they found was using that, you actually got a chemical stimulus of autophagy and it was brokered through mTOR. So I won't go too much deeper into that. Let's go to a next, uh, our next article. It's in Cell Metabolism back in 2011 from some U.S. authors. Autophagy regulates the cholesterol efflux from foam cells. Now, what is that? So foam cells are uh, aging cells that have been very active. There are macrocytes, some of the immune cells. And what's going on with those things is that they're going into an area where they're finding a lot of cholesterol in a place that it shouldn't be. Uh, people want to just argue about that cholesterol is always good. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that. Uh, we'll get into actually some of the discussion about whether LDL, HDL, even HDL um, and LP little a are the arson, the firemen, or maybe neither one, maybe just gawking bystanders who are interested in, in seeing what happened. In other words, bioindicators. So anyhow, back to this article, lipid droplets are the major site of cholesterol storage in a macrophage foam cell. So that's the cell, the immune cell, the macrophage that has come in, seen uh, areas or pools of cholesterol that are in the wrong place, forming plaque. And it, it gobbles that um, cholesterol up to take it somewhere else. Cholesterol esters are liberated from these cells and delivered to cholesterol acceptors. The lysosomes break the cholesterol-loaded macrophages. In other words, you remember these pockets with enzymes in them? They help break up these macrophages and um, start digesting this whole soup. It gets enhanced by autophagy, leading to reverse cho cholesterol transport. In other words, uh, the other topic, it's, it's not that... Uh, it's not a big word, but you may not understand the concept of reverse cholesterol transport. When you talk about cholesterol transport, you're talking usually about 
it going from central organs like uh, the liver out to uh, cells where it may be used for things like uh, creating a, a cell wall structure. Reverse cholesterol transport is taking cholesterol from the outside, the body, outside of, not outside of the body, but uh, from the body, outside of the central area. So outside of the liver and bringing it back to the liver. So what this is talking about, lysosomes um, helping break up. Uh, so first of all, um, macros, macrocytes coming in, finding all of these uh, plaques out in the artery walls of your heart, which is the important place, but you find them in your groin, the, the arteries to your leg, the femoral arteries to your leg. So these macrophages find this, these immune cells do. They start gobbling it up. Then lysosomes start breaking these things down. And then they start uh, reversing the transportation to send this back to the liver. So <clears throat> now you're beginning to get a little bit more of a microscopic metabolic level uh, picture of what's going on in terms of autophagy and uh, management of plaque. So here's another article, more recent, uh, Journal of Inflammation, uh, 2019. The researchers were, uh, the authors were in Iran. Atherosclerosis derives from chronic inflammation. Uh, I'm not going to go down that bunny hole. If you've not heard of that, then you haven't been attending. The, you haven't seen much on this channel because we talk about that all the time. Cardiovascular inflammation. Autophagy response could be modulated in favor to restore the cell function and reduce the pro-inflammatory or the inflammatory status under pathological conditions. In other words, Autophagy actually decreases inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation. And you know what? <clears throat> we see that time and time and time and time again. You know, people come in, if they haven't already started on their weight loss journey, that's the most common thing that we see in terms of driving this process other than the number one item, which is age. So age is the number one driver of this. But the obesity epidemic is a, maybe a strong number two. Genetics are important. Um, <clears throat> if I've seen it once, I've seen it hundreds of times. People come in to see me and they've already started a weight loss journey. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but here's what happens. We, one of the things we do in the very beginning is we measure cardiovascular inflammation. If you're not familiar with that, we've done several series on cardiovascular inflammation panel. Uh, there's different labs that we use to, to measure that. HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein made, made by the liver. It's the most common biological false positive of the panel. Um, Myeloperoxidase, MPO, uh, that is one of the actual actors in this play. My, myeloperoxidase is in the lysosomes of polymorphonuclear sites, one of the uh, immune cells. Um, and it's being released as a part of this inflammatory process. Um, the other, there's another enzyme that we look at too, L, uh, LPPLA2, plaque 2 that is part of the lysosomes of the macrocytes. And again, being released as a part of the process that we've just been discussing over the past few slides. You get this process going on of your immune cells, the macrocytes uh, and the, uh, the polymorphs, two different groups of uh, immune cells finding too much um, plaque in the external uh, cardiovascular tree, getting uh, excited, getting um, induced, their lysosomes release MPO and uh, LPPLA2. We actually can measure the MPO myeloperoxidase and the LPPLA2. 
they help us understand what level of inflammation you have going on, specific to cardiovascular inflammation. There's one other test that we look at on the cardiovascular inflammation profile. profile. And it may be in many ways one of the most functional because it's uh, called the MACR, microalbumin creatinine ratio. Now that comes from, basically we're looking at microproteinuria, protein in the urine in very microscopic amounts. Why is that important? Because it's the lining of the artery that suffers the most during cardiovascular inflammation. The lining of the artery is also the filter membrane of each of the million filters in each of our two kidneys. If that membrane is undergoing inflammation, you're likely to be spilling minor amounts of protein through your kidney. We can pick that up. We can understand that, detect that, measure that, and get a good measurement of cardiovascular inflammation. So again, trying to take a few minutes, pardon me if, the, uh, if we're, there's a few bunny holes, but what I'm trying to do is connect the dots where if you go back a couple of slides where we're talking about lysosomes, well, you know, the lysosomes are releasing MPO and LPPLA2. And you talk about reverse cholesterol transport. Again, we see it all day, every day, where people are uh, losing weight um, for one reason or another. The most common mechanisms that I have for people coming in that have already lost 30, 40, 150 pounds. Number one, they say, well, first I dropped my carbs and then my, my hunger sort of just really decreased. Then I had, some people start with intermittent fasting, added IF. Um, again, IF, as we discussed and discovered a few weeks ago, is really in some ways a way of decreasing carbs as well, because your body, after about a day and a half, you're starting to live on uh, not carbs anymore. So you're starting to develop the mechanism to become fat adapted. Once you become fat adapted, whether it's from IF, intermittent fasting, or uh, prolonged fasting, or decreasing your carbs, then this roller coaster of high blood sugar followed by dropping blood, you know, insulin release, then your blood sugar drops, and then you get hungry again. All of that roller coaster stuff starts going away. You lose this hunger drive, and then you, you start eating a much more appropriate level of food. So anyhow, I'm, I've gone down enough bunny holes to confuse myself. I'm going to get back on track. Autophagy and aging. This was in a, um, a scientific journal called Curious 2021. The authors were from Wales. <clears throat> and they're talking about aging-induced alterations in the intracellular signaling. Like I said before, people think that the... Um, the obesity epidemic is driving the, ins the insulin resistance or diabetes epidemic. And no, that's not the case. It is a pretty close second. But, and I don't know if you could really say it's a pretty close second. It's a dramatic second, the uh, second place. The impact of obesity on our health as a population is just devastating. But the number one cause is still aging. And that's what this article went into. It started talking about what does aging actually do? It reviewed over 90 articles. Um, it talked about caloric restriction and intermittent fasting, talking about how that induces autophagy. In other words, as I said a couple of times during this show already, the simplest, yes. I mean, you can go to things like rapamycin. But think about it. It's, it's a hassle. You got to find a doc that's comfortable writing it. And I'm not. I haven't written it for people. It's just, it's, there's a lot of hassles associated with rapamycin. And here's the thing. Caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting, all of these things are absolutely free. And 
um, they're far healthier. So these, these things promote reduction of the pro-inflammatory markers such as homocysteine, IL-6, interleukin-6, C-reactive protein, the other ones that we talked about a few minutes ago, microbiome and creatinine ratio, uh, MPO, myeloperoxidase, uh, LPPLA2. So think about it. As I said before, rapamycin and resveratrol can in, induce autophagy as well, at least according to those authors. But it's just so much simpler, so easier, and so in line with health to just don't eat as much. There are ways to do that. So anyhow, <clears throat> let me go to the next article. Metabolic syndrome and plaque. This was in Frontiers in Cell and Devi uh, Developmental Biology. 2021, authors from Japan. This was a review of over 160 articles. They talked about metabolic syndrome and plaque. Now, they're, they sort of went in circles, and I don't exactly agree with the circles. So they're saying metabolic syndrome and plaque are caused by oxidative stress, inflammation, and insulin resistance. I would agree with that. Insulin resistance becomes the major first step for the vast majority of us. And as I said before, that is usually driven by aging, but it's also driven in a big way by body fat. We used to think that body fat was an inert energy storage tissue. It's not. It's become very clear over the past decade that body fat is a destructive tissue. It's a hormonal tissue and it drives insulin resistance. Hence the reason that obesity, overweight, and even moderate levels of weight can and are some of the major drivers, the number two driver of insulin resistance, um, prediabetes, diabetes, and therefore cardiovascular disease and a lot of cancers. So basal and mild adapt adaptive autophagy protect against the progression of plaque and they can actually help uh, reverse that process. That's the we're not talking about one art article. We're talking about 160 articles going into this, uh, this, this pool of scientific evidence. Multiple drugs can help, might help, but control of autophagy is the goal of success. And again, we've got all of us have immediate, well, not immediate access, for some of us, it might take us a few hours to get access to that autophagy. Um, just get started with um, intermittent fasting and you'll see what I mean. So, like I said, we got a little bit technical, but we did cover a significant part of the scientific evidence behind control of plaque, even reversal of plaque with autophagy. So if you'll give us the, uh, the transition, we'll go into Q&A. So I'm going to put my glasses on. I need to get some glasses without so much reflection on this. Um, anyhow, oh gosh, we've got... Woo, we have got a lot of questions. The, the early bird gets the answer. So JMK 2920, well, Dennis Williamson says, period, dot. JMK 2921 says, how can LP little a be causative for coronary artery disease when LP little a doesn't even show up in coronary plaque until days after the initial endothelial injury? That's really a good question. It's, I, I would say, I think that's an, uh, a rhetorical question, isn't it, JMK? I think you're making the point that um, maybe it's not the arson, maybe it is the fireman. And I would say, you know, actually, that same question goes for LDL, and in reverse, also for HDL, you know, my perspective is, yeah, uh, LDL and LP little a might not be the arsons. They might not even be the firemen either. They might just be 
innocent bystanders that got pulled into this. And in other words, maybe their role is just bio indicator. And I would say that that may be the same thing for HDL in reverse. So Bart says, good morning. Good morning for to you, Bart, in New Jersey. Uh, Dan Stewart. Don Stewart. Calcium is 10.4. Take a, 800 milligrams of calcium. Do you think that's causing it or a parathyroid problem? Uh, the first thing, you know, it's a great point, Don. Thank you so much for bringing it up. I have that same discussion multiple times. So if you're in your 20s and your calcium goes up to 10.4, that's not an issue. Um, if you're 65 and it goes up to 10.4, you really need to get it checked. And you can go to an endocrine person or you can go to a, uh, a thyroid surgeon. You, I would recommend the endocrine person because that person needs to, to document your parathyroid hormone. And yes, it's not an aggressive uh, cancer, but it's a cancer. It's a growth. It's a malignancy that happens as we get into our 60s, 70s, and 80s. And it's not something that you want to ignore. So if you were in your 20s, we could say, mm, that's not, not a big deal. Let's you know move on. But not in your 60s. And Don, I don't know your, how old you are. So forgot to mention vitamin D is 83. Yep. And when you go to an endocrine person and you have these uh, levels in the 60s, 70s and 80s, they'll probably tell you to go off of vitamin D, but they're not going to ignore your, uh, your calcium level. That's a different issue. Bobby Ocampo, my Mabu, hi, Bobby. Magandang buhe hi. <clears throat> I was going to say that my uh, dipologue, my Filipino uh, language, is about as bad as my Spanish, but no, it's a lot worse. My buhay anyway. Uh, happy life. Like, share, and comment. Thank you, Bobby. Bobby's a, a, a physician, I think, in the Philippines and has. Uh, has shared a lot on this channel. We appreciate it. E.T. himself, P.S.T. Canada. My brother lives in Canada. Um, my sister-in-law. I'm a big fan of Canadians in general. Not the greatest fan of their health care, but that's a different subject for a different time. But E.T., I have no idea what you mean by P.S.T. Maybe you're saying, Psst, I'm in Canada. I don't know. Bobby Ocampo, what is acetyl-CoA in autophagy? Well, acetyl-CoA is part of the, uh, the TCA cycle, tri tricyclic uh, acid cycle, or um, it's part of the, the currency of energy once you get down into beyond, much deeper than a metabolic level, much deeper than a cellular level, much deeper than a organelle level, mitochondrial level, we're talking molecular level, TCA, tricyclic, uh, or the um, uh, <clears throat> and again, anyhow, the metabolic process of making energy. And so that's the major component. Um, if you're telling me that there's other things that if you give somebody exogenous acetyl-CoA that it'll impact autophagy, not familiar with that evidence. Bambi Grage, good morning. Any benefit with lifeline screening? Have been unable to get a CIMT. <sighs> well, yes. Benefit, yes. Some risk, uh, somewhat. Um, a lot of the CIMT techs that I work with have done stints with lifeline screening. Now, I, I get mixed reviews on them. Uh, part of my reviews is that, uh, part of the reviews that I get is that, okay, they are, they're okay. Others will say, no, you know, it's just like a cattle car. You bring too many people in, you don't have enough time to focus on getting the right level of CIMT. Now, to remind you, 
uh, I think a CIMT is, is helpful and important, but the things that take a lot of time are things that just say, okay, do I have a uh, high plaque for my age? And that's the one item that's, you can get into some garbage in, garbage out. So I would not use a CIMT from Lifeline to say my arterial age. That would be a mistake. Unfortunately, the Lifeline CIMTs that I have seen didn't really have a lot of clarity on the thing that is important, and that is, do you have soft plaque? So as you can see, I've got a lot of, issues, both pros and cons regarding <clears throat> lifeline. JMK2921, does an ankle brachial index have any predictive pow uh, power for future mace? <sighs> <clears throat> the short answer is yes. Uh, go back, <clears throat> look up one of my videos. It's called Do-It-Yourself Cardiovascular Eva Risk Evaluation. It was um, I was teaching people how to do the ABI, the ankle brachial index. And that was actually I, I covered some from uh, uh, videos on Stanford that were talking about exactly how to do that. It became a very popular video. I think it was because it was DIY, do it yourself, cardiovascular inflammation. Um, but it also caused a lot of confusion because you got to know how to do the numbers. You really do. So, uh, Sophie Ann Mez, man, I was just taking notes from other videos. <laughs> I don't know if you're talking about the fact that we get a little bit deep and a little bit technical. I mean, that's part of what we try to do is actually show the real science. I used to, um, I used to be an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins. I, uh, I started off as an ER doc. And just got really frustrated with yet another heart attack coming into my ER that could have, would have, should have not happened at all, or at least not happened for another two decades. And it's like, so what do I want to do? Uh, ER is fun. You know, after I quit ER, they started making TV shows and movies about it. It's, you know, it's exciting. You run codes on people and a, running a code is exciting. But, you know, after you run the 40th or 50th code, you begin to see the reality that this was 1981 and we were adding eight to thirty thousand dollars, 1981 dollars to the funeral bill of these patients. The bottom line is you do not want to have a heart attack and have me or anybody else try to pull you back out of the heart attack. You want to prevent it. And <clears throat> so the epiphany that happened to me after that umpteenth heart attack, preventable heart attack was, I, I need to get into prevention. And that really hurt me, <laughs> me as an individual, because there were two things that I really, really did not want to do. Uh, when I grew up, when I was young, I did not want to become a teacher. You know, if you've heard Charlie Brown, the teacher going, that was, I didn't, uh, it wasn't that I didn't respect the profession. It was that I felt like teachers teach much less than students learn. In other words, if the student doesn't want to learn, the teacher has just got huge challenges. The other thing that I didn't want to be was a bean counter, an accountant. And the bottom line is when you're in prevention, you go to Hopkins, that's where I went, and you become a teacher and a bean counter. That's exactly what I did. You have to get really, really good with statistics, biostatistics, epidemiology, and you have to get really good at teaching people and doctors prevention. And so, you know what? Be careful what you ask for. That's what I've been doing ever since. That uh, frustrating day in the ER with yet another 55-year-old heart attack that should never have happened. <clears throat> Margaret D., good morning. Good morning to you, Margaret. I. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Have a great day. Again, I'm getting a little bit of a scratch back here. 
<clears throat> Thank you for your patience with me as I get a sip. Bobby Ocampo, what's the optimum range for PSA tests? My PSA before was 4.09 and 3.2, and it's now 3.20. <clears throat> Not going to be able to give you the optimum range for that, Bobby. I, um, but I will a little bit later as we get into the men's health series. Wayne H. Closing your eating window early one day before noon and opening it later the next day, late afternoon, gives you a longer fast and increases the probability of gaining autophagy. Absolutely right. You know, it's one. <clears throat> you know, I talked earlier about. People coming in and saying, you know, I lost 30 pounds and um, what do I do? Hold on just a second. We're having a little bit of a technical issue. So I lost 30 pounds and, you know, what do I do next? And I've already started intermittent fasting. I've already started um, uh, watching my carbs. What do I do next? And this, the answer is always right there. Have you tried? Prolonged fasting. Well, prolonged fasting, by my definition and most definitions, is having gaps of 24 hours or more in your fasting. And Wayne H., what, that's exactly what you've just described. That is also very, very powerful in terms of driving autophagy. It's, you know, something that I mentioned earlier. And here's the thing. I get very few takers on that. Uh, and I understand why. It's not easy to get your head wrapped around not eating anything for 24 hours or more. That's part of our cultural problem. Mezzanine, scheduled for a colonoscopy next month. 57 years, taking patabastatin, ezetimide, 81 milligrams aspirin, and 3,500 milligrams of fish oil. Two procedures since 2019 led to bleeding complications. Worried and considering canceling. Uh, <clears throat> uh you, you put that as a question mark. The first thing I would say, Mezzanine, is you know, I can't advise you on whether or not to cancel. Um because I, you know, I have to see you as a patient. I have to, you know, I have to be your doctor at least for that advice. I can say a few generic things though. Colon cancer screening is critical. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we're covering it. I've had one patient that was less than 50. They were 49 and a half that came down with um, colon cancer. And, um, you know, Bozeman, well, I, was, uh, I can't remember Bozeman's first name. It's uh, somebody help me. You know, what, 30 something year old? And I've got a friend now and business associate who's 30 something year old son has a diagnosis of colon cancer as well. So it is a big, big deal. And it kills people. And guess what? Over half of colon cancers coulda, woulda, shoulda been prevented in terms of their impact on life if you just did the screening. So um, <clears throat> don't, uh, one thing I can say is don't cancel or don't not get screening for colon cancer. It's, it's killing people needlessly. Uh, Paul Pellico, speaking of aggressive cancers, my wife and I recently lost our baby boy's battle with an aggressive sarcoma called CIC, CIC Ducks 4. I am sorry to hear that. I had uh, a friend back when I was in uh, med school who had a sarcoma um, and lost her leg, but retained her life. ET himself, there's a formula for calculating D3 for overweight people. Is there a formula for calculating D3? No, there isn't, not that I'm aware of. Is it perhaps 20 pounds or 50 pounds? I cannot find anything reliable for this topic, many thanks. I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. I mean, here's what I think you might be saying, and it does. it's a good, question if you are and that is do you find a an impact on d3 absorption 
and D3 levels impacted by body fat? And there's no question. Yes, you do. As people are gaining weight, they tend to, uh, their D3 level tends to drop. So let's go back and think about that for a second. Vitamin D3 is fat soluble. So when you're in a mode of gaining weight, you're also, you appear to be in a mode of depositing vitamin D3 in those body fat tissues. When you're losing weight, your D3 can, tends to go up. So just be aware of that. Any formulas for that? Never heard of any. Paul Pellico, not sure if anybody actually survives this rare killer. Not either, not at all familiar with it. It's been three years now and we're still trying to get up off the floor. It's a tragedy and I, am, I appreciate you sharing it with us. I am sorry to hear that it happened. I've got a friend named Gary Latimer. He does a lot of work with um, <clears throat> a thing called, um, well, it's a test. It's similar to, we do a thing called, called CNS for sputum, for infections of the lung. And CNS means culture and sensitivity. We test, you know, if somebody has um, uh, a bacteria growing in their lungs, we want to get some of that, test it with different types of antibiotics to find out which ones will work. You know, you would think that we might do that with cancer. And that's exactly what Gary's test does. But here's a big problem with that. He hasn't been able to get I mean, he's gotten people to test it. He's gotten many people to use it, except he struggles the most with getting oncologists to use it. And you know why? Unfortunately, oncologists tend to buy the uh, anti-cancer drugs and then they give them. Now, I'm not at all implying that that happened, you know, happened with your son, Paul, or with anybody else. It's just a very unfortunate thing that's going on in terms of uh, cancer treatment. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> what's frustrating is the difficulties in making a change. So <clears throat> that program, again, I'll, I'll just say one or two more comments about it and then go out of that, that uh, go to the next question. That process is similar to a CNS for uh, sputum for a, um, an infection of the lung. It's basically taking a portion of the cancer itself and incubating it with different types of anti-neoplastic or anti-cancer drugs, chemotherapy, to find out which ones specifically this specific cancer works with. So JMK2921, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, why do you think the mainstream media did almost no discussion or debate about autophagy, <clears throat> metabolic health, vitamin D? Well, <laughs> Why do you think, JMK? You're, you've got a lot of rhetorical questions today. You know, uh, why do you think they're completely focused on LDL even today? Um, you know, you, you bring up an excellent point. Um, during the entire pandemic, more people were still dying from cardiovascular disease, except for about a two-week period. Then we're dying from COVID. And yet none of that cardiovascular stuff got attention. And as you also know, even the people that were dying from COVID uh, actually had significant, what they called, uh, even the media called comorbidities. Well, comorbidity of diabetes means that, you know, it's the diabetes killing you more so than the virus. So, if you say virus and if you say COVID-19, you've made a political statement these days. I'm going to move on. Ricky the Gun One. Hello from North Carolina, Doc. I've been using a CGM. That stands for, if you haven't heard of it, that stands for Continuous Glucose Monitoring. Yesterday, I had a salad and a sushi roll and it spiked to 194. Our glucose spikes are average, more important to health drink, uh, damage. It's the average. And thank you so much, Ricky the Gun, for pointing that out. Uh, 
Japanese people up until recently tended to be very thin and tended to have very little cardiovascular disease. And so people think they always ate great food. Uh, in fact, when you get into this debate about carbs, you get people saying, oh, no, no, no. Uh, carbs are fine. Uh, Japanese were all, always healthy from a cardiovascular perspective and they eat rice. So it proves that carbs is not a problem. Not really. Uh, body fat and the amount of time under elevated glucose is the most important thing. So, uh, yes, carbs are very important. Don't let that twisted logic um, take you down the wrong path. Thank you so much for, for sharing that example, Ricky. Bobby Ocampo, maybe the guidelines on prediabetes and diabetes should just be called diabetes so people will not take prediabetes for granted and be as concerned. You know, you bring up a great point, Bobby. You may remember I did a video on saying, you know what, it's so overcomplicating and confusing the issue when we say prediabetes that we should get rid of that term. I don't get rid of the term because when people hear it, they think, well, I've got prediabetes, so that I don't have a problem. Mm. If I've heard that once, I've heard it how many thousands of times? I do wish we would get rid of. I mean, you're right. It's a disease process, and it's the same disease process. The only difference is at some point, you had a fasting glucose over 125. Uh, at some point, you had a, a peak glucose over 200. Blaine Robertson, Dr. Brewer, I send my eligibility form in weeks ago, but haven't heard back. How do I move it forward? Okay, you're talking about the, um, the Medicare program. We have your name. Uh, you, can, you can check in. Um, Gilbert, if you, if you will show the telephone number and the email address, I appreciate it. So send an email to that address or call and just confirm that you're on the list. Um, like I said before, we have a few people that we started with. Those were pilot patients. <clears throat> we're also piloting through the billing cycle. Once we get that up and rolling, we will start bringing on a lot more um, patients. But it, you just need to make sure that you're on the wait list. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things I'll do, I think we should be... Um, I'm just taking a note real quick. We'll start seeing if we can get notice out for people that they are on the wait list. It's a really, really good point. And I'm sorry that you haven't heard back, Blaine. Okay, so let me see if I can move this up. Blaine again. I sent my, oh, same thing. Bobby Ocampo, maybe standard on fasting blood sugar and A1C to be lowered. Dr. Bernstein's standard is 83 fasting glucose, and 4.8 A1C. I know. Bernstein is really, really... People think I'm aggressive. You ought to work with uh, Dr. Bernstein, the father of diabetes self-care. William Clifford, thank you for great info. What are your best heart-healthy supplements and blood pressure meds until my positive lifestyle changes kick in? The most, the two most commonly used supplements, I, I the, the two supplements that I use the most common are vitamin D3 and uh, niacin. Don't just take niacin because you hear about it. You need to have a good reason to take it. Um, and most of us have that. Niacin is the only thing that lowers uh, LDL, increases HDL. And again, as we talked about before, that might not be that those are the actors. It might be that those are the, the bystanders gawking at the process. Um, on blood pressure medicine, so many people are still on um, thiazide diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide. That's the last, that used to be the first line. That should be one of the last lines now. You should look first at um, uh, uh, one of the things ending in pril, like lisinopril, uh, benazapril, uh, these are things that impact the hormones associated with blood pressure. 
and blood volume. They're called ACE inhibitors. Now, a lot of people can't take ACE inhibitors because of the cough. <clears throat> I'm one of them. Um, I took it for years and I continued to cough during my presentations and people would say, you need to get off of those ACE inhibitors. And I finally did. I ended up going with the ARBs, uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, for those of you that are curious about what that means. But you should start with one of those. Then the next one should be, in most cases, a calcium channel blocker like amlodipine. But there, each of us is an individual. There are plenty of exceptions to those rules. Check in with your doctor. If you want to check in with us, again, uh, you can call the number that, um, uh, that uh, Gilbert showed up there a few minutes ago and come see us as a patient. Rob, how long after starting Ozempic did you start sleeping better? 36 hours. 36 hours. It was just amazing. Guitar Guy Fry. And, and the, part of the point behind that is I know because of having experienced it myself, this is not a weight related thing, just like we saw. And that was part of the reason that I, I put that article in there because of, you know, they showed that as well. It's got an impact on sleep and it's not from weight loss. Guitar Guy Fry. I took 500 milligrams of niacin. My eyes looked yellow the next day. Mm, be very careful. I think I don't think you should. Uh, the biggest major concern, there are two concerns with taking niacin. You know, unlike, you know, there's some supplements that are just completely harmless, like uh, vitamin B12 is harmless. And by the way, it's something you really need to consider, especially as you start getting past age 65 and <clears throat> especially if you're taking metformin, but we'll, you know, we can talk about that at another time. Niacin on the other hand, and vitamin K2 is another uh, supplement that you can take a lot of hundreds of times the normal or the usual dose and not get a problem, but you cannot do that with niacin. Niacin does two things for a few months. It'll increase your, diabetes, your insulin resistance. And for some people, it'll cause liver problems. And if your eyes are turning yellow, the first thing you think about is liver problems. So I would not take that ag again if I had yellow eyes resulting from it. John Tocho, hit the thumbs up button. Thank you so much, John. 160 of us. Actually, <clears throat> On my watch uh, icon right now, it's showing 211. Only 40, uh, 60 thumbs up likes. Thank you so much, John. And again, if you want to help us out, if you're interested enough to be watching, uh, you don't have, it, it's very easy. Just hit the thumbs up. Um, Gilbert, do you have a place where you can show how, where that thumbs up is so people can see? E.T. himself. Uh, guitar guy Fry said, says, take it 200. John Tocho, only 49 likes and 160 watching. 213 watching on my side. Thumbs up. Thank you again, John. I appreciate that. Bobby Ocampo, my friend said that Ozempic is given free in Canada as part of their Medicare. That's interesting. Well, I do know that um, Ozempic is covered here in the United States on Medicare as well. It's not free, but it's a reasonable copay. ET is, uh, so ET is saying, if you're taking niacin, take 200, 500 is too much. Actually, ET, I've got a ton of people that are taking 500, 1,000, even up to 2,000. A lot of recommendations are higher than 2000. I do not recommend that. I don't, I think the juice is not worth the squeeze. Rick Folia, good morning from Atlanta. John Tocho, eating low carb. My numbers look insulin resistant, not diabetic. So no Ozempic. Coughed up the money for Wagovi. Oh, interesting, John. Well, you don't, if that's your picture, you don't look like, you have too much of a problem with body fat, but uh, it looks that sepia coloring makes me think it's an old, old picture. Okay, so just started month two of Wegovi. Keep us posted on that. 
I'm a big, big fan <clears throat> of the Glip ones and a big fan of weight loss. It's a big, big deal. William Brewster, interesting article in latest AARP magazine about CCTA um, with clearly in Medicare now paying for it. Any thoughts? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, as I have said before, I've done uh, CT angiogram, which is what you're talking about. CT angiogram on a lot of people. It's one of the things that I've used. And I've said, yes, it is an up and comer. I've had a couple of people come back and tell me, oh, I'm doing um, Peter Diamandis and uh, somebody remind me, uh, he's the motivational speaker, Tony Robbins. They have a program on health where they're doing this AI driven CCTA. And again, I think that technology is going to become a standard at some point. Is it now ready for prime time? Like, Tony Robbins and Diamandis think. I'm not so sure that that is, but different subject for a different time. John Tocho, yes, ET is saying yes. Please hit the like button. Appreciate that. Wayne H, is the blood glucose ketone ratio or BOS ratio as good of an indicator of autophagy as others suggest? It's a good indicator. Uh, Dr. Boz is doing some great great work helping people lose weight, uh, helping people get used to um, all the things associated with a, a keto type diet and fasting. Um, as with everybody, you know, I'm a big fan, but not in a hundred percent agreement. One of the, one of the things that I'm not in a hundred percent agreement on with Dr. Boz is the exogenous um, ketones. And that's where you eat things, uh, ketones and rather than waiting for your body to make them uh, the, w that's so easily abused you know one of the big problems is people think they can continue to eat all they want as often as they want and if they just eat exogenous ketones that's going to get them there no and, and you know dr Baez doesn't recommend that either but it's just it's always something in it Bobby Ocampo, I've forwarded a link of your courses to our professional regulation committee. Hope they will recommend your courses to Filipino doctors. Thank you so much, Bobby. JMK, the challenge with the Clearly company is that their program hardware is only available in certain cities, similar to the issue in getting an accurate CIMT. Very very good point, JMK. I appreciate that. Bart Robinson, after a high, ca high calcium score of 490 six years ago, I'm getting a CT angiogram, an NMR. I've had no symptoms, but I just want peace of mind. Hopefully with a good report. I hope so too, Bart. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing. Thankfully, my insurance is covering it. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Bobby Ocampo, Tommy Woods is saying that 30 minutes of exercise is equivalent to three days of fasting. Well, I don't think three, 30 minutes of a mild walk, which a lot of people would call exercise, is that equivalent. Let me do just a time check here. 1113. I've got time for a few more. Um Ask yourself, what do you really know? That's an interesting label. The mold link is interesting. Just not sure where you're coming from. Ask Bobby Ocampa. Nadir Ali is calling small LDL as injured firefighters. Exactly. He is. That's exactly what he's calling them. Is he right? You know, he's got a point, but is he right? I'm not so sure. You know, what happens with small, dense LDL, and I've covered that, and still, uh, it, go back to uh, some of my triglyceride over HDL ratio uh, videos. And a couple of years ago, back when Quest Diagnostics was still providing the actual um, bell curve of the HDL and LDL particles when they tested you, you could see it time and time and time again. If somebody had a carb metabolism problem, it impacted both HDL and LDL. And it what did it impact? 
the large fluffy HDL population and the large fluffy LDL population. It was just very clear, laid right out there on the graphs. And I showed some of those graphs. The impact is actually different on HDL than it is on LDL. But, you know, you have to ask the question, why do you see that with them? Here's why. Because when you've got a, a uh, prediabetes, diabetes, insulin resistant type of metabolism, you start replacing the cholesterol in the large fluffy particles of HDL or LDL with fatty acids. Well, a fatty acid laden particle, whether it's HDL or LDL, gets burned, metabolized as it goes through the liver. So what happens then? You lose your large fluffy HDL and your large fluffy LDL. It's interesting. It's a very different uh, look of the graphs itself. On the HDL, it looks like some a shark came along and took a bite out of the large fluffy side of the bell curve. With LDL, on the other hand, it does something very, very different. It just tends to move the whole curve. Sometimes it skews the curve a little bit as well. But very, very interesting. And thank you so much, Bobby, for taking us down that bunny hole. Ricky the Gun One, I know that increased insulin resistance can negatively affect eyesight. Can farsightedness or presbyopia be attributed to insulin resistance? Usually not. It, yes, it can impact. It, it tends to have it <clears throat> a little bit different impact. Um, and I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't attribute presbyopia to insulin resistance. Um, and I wouldn't say that you can cure it with uh, curing your insulin resistance either. Kim de Basquale, Farsight, and this has to do with anterior posterior anatomy, anatomy of the eye, which can't be changed. And Kim, I would agree more with your point. The eye is small in this uh, dimension. Bobby Ocampo, EGFR, uh, the glomerular, glomerular, easy for me to say, huh? Filtration rate. In other words, the kidney function. Is it compared to the microbiome and creatinine ratio? No, it's compared to the creatinine level but it's very important. If somebody has an elevated microbiome and creatinine ratio, that's a sign, a very, very strong sign that damage is occurring to the kidney and the damage is occurring to the lining of the artery walls. And you really want to have that checked out. And as in case you didn't know, the number one cause of that damage is diabetes, insulin resistance. Leslie Hook, will this be able to be, yes, you can review this afterwards. Um, <clears throat> that's what uh, YouTube does. YouTube takes these YouTube lives and then they just uh, keep it up, post it. And we'll do that. One of the things that happens is when you look at a YouTube video and you see two hours, you may think, oh, my gosh, <clears throat> I was interested in that topic, but I don't have two hours to listen to that. So one of the things that we do is we take snippets out as short as 30 to 50 seconds and get some of the snippets and put those on. Uh, the other thing that uh, we do is we'll get up to like eight or 15 or, or 10 minute uh, video sections as well. So if you have a specific topic that you're interested in, Leslie, take a look. It's probably going to be up there. We've got 1,500 videos there. Bobby Ocampo, how can autophagy help retinopathy, glaucoma, and cataracts? So <clears throat> retinopathy, glaucoma, and cataracts, the vast majority of it is very much associated with diabetes, cardiovascular inflammation. And in fact, you bring up a good point. When you look at the eyeball, the eyeball is more analogous to brain tissue than anything else outside of the skull. So the eyeball is a great way to look at what's going on in the brain. And guess what? Retinopathy. I have I did a video a couple of years ago to show that I had one druse. A druse is a cholesterol deposit <clears throat> around the arteries in the back of the eye. You never hear that term. What you hear is drusen because you see multiples of it. 
in people with diabetes. Yes, although I had diabetes, I documented it. Most doctors would never think that I had because they don't know how to diagnose it. And I control it very, very well. So I only had one Druze. Uh, so yes, it's the number one cause of blindness, diabetes, just like the number one cause of kidney disease, diabetes, due to this cardiovascular inflammation that we've just been talking about. In fact, the first part of our uh, major content today was about using autophagy to decrease this process. So we have healthy eyes, healthy kidneys, healthy heart, healthy brain. So <clears throat> um, we are, I'm about to turn into a pumpkin. I've got a, uh, a meeting. I've got patients all afternoon. I appreciate the interest today. We had a lot of folks, as John Tocho pointed out, and a lot of great questions remaining. Unfortunately, I just do not have the time to hit all of them. So come join us next week. Get that question in earlier and uh, we'll see if we can respond. The early bird gets the worm and the early question gets the answer. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs>